Hey, my name is Jeff. I worked 26 years in Hollywood on pretty much all the back lots everywhere and in the studios. And as a filmmaker myself, I wanted to know if I made a film, could I sell it afterwards? So I spent a good portion of time uh, going to the American film market at the Lowe's Hotel at that time uh, in, in uh, Santa Monica, going from room to room where uh, uh, sales reps would be there. They had their, their small movie posters and their one sheets and trailers and buyers from all over the world would walk into those rooms and pick up the one sheets, look at the trailer. Uh, in the good old days, which were back in the uh, late 80s, or any time in the 80s for that matter, maybe a little bit into the, uh, into the early 90s as well, buyers could come in with suitcases of money and buy the rights for a territory uh, for anything. Let's say Germany or West Indies or Australia. Uh, and, and they would buy rights. They would buy for their territory. They might be one buyer that would come in. Let's say, let's, let's say Australia. One buyer from Australia would come in. He would bring in money for cable rights. And then another buyer would come in and say, well, I'm going to give you, uh, at this time it would have been VHS. I want to give you uh, X amount of dollars for a uh, one or two year license for all of the uh, VHS market in Australia, or uh, later as it evolved into DVD. And that's how it went. You could sell individually to each of these countries. And I think at that time there were 144 buying countries. I think it's, it's gone uh, north of there since then. Um, but markets like these happened all over the world. They happened in the way of festivals. Festivals kind of worked in the same way. Um, they all have kind of uh, audience screenings. So get people excited in the, in, the, in the screenings, see how, you know, weigh it out, see what the audience reactions are, and then go immediately make, uh, make an offer on a film. Uh, and it was the same thing for theatrical exhibitors as well. Um, let's say if you're here in the U.S., you might have had AMC, uh, you might have had uh, different uh, distributors, Sony, for instance, come in and bid on your film for the, uh, the exclusive theatrical release. Uh, and they would, the bigger studios would cover bigger uh, or larger territories, of course. They might, they might cover uh, North America, including Canada. They might include Mexico. Uh, they might have their affiliates in, in Europe somewhere. Uh, representing you as well. So there are all these different ways to slice up uh, money and, and, and make, make a ton of dough that way. That was a long time ago. In fact, in those days, you could pre-sell a film. If you had a star attached, it had to be shot in color, um, you had a good chance of pre-selling so that you'd use that pre-sale money uh, or, or, or at least a, a guarantee that said you're, you've got distribution afterwards, theatrical distribution or, or ancillary markets, and the ancillary markets would be DVD, cable, satellite, those kind of things. Uh, then you could go use that as a, either that guarantee uh, that you had distribution, go to a bank, get a bank loan. You'd have to get some gap financing for, for the little that was short there. Uh, or you, they would just outright give you the money and you... You, you've got a $2 million budget? Well, guess what? You've got, uh, you've got now uh, seven, $750,000 in your hand from a pre-sale? Guess what? You figure ways to slash the budget and go make the film that way. And nobody has to, nobody has to know uh, how much the film actually costs. So then you would go back and say, well, yeah, here's my $2 million film. And then you were... Uh, able to sell to the rest of the territories. Now, the dark side of this for smaller filmmakers, uh, and I had this happen to a number of friends, is that uh, they would go to someplace like the American film market and uh, some sales rep, uh, which is basically a broker. He, uh, a sales rep is somebody that offers to represent your film like it sounds to the territories and they might have a certain uh, territory and, and kind of, uh, ancillary market or theatrical 
uh, market that they're going to handle that, that their territory. Um, so the sales rep, bad news for the small indie guy was they would forever be building in expenses into the budget so that you never make money. Okay. So I, I give you an example. Um, if, and, and it, this is all dirty pool. Okay. So if you're at the American film market, a sales rep says, well, I'm going to rep your, represent your film. Uh, and then you're going to get a bill for all these things that they've deducted. Okay, your, your movie made $50,000, $100,000 in sales, but guess what? Oh, you know, the hotel was charging us $5,000 for the fax machine. The suite rental was uh, $10,000 a day. Uh, we have all these other expenses that were built in there. I had to have sales reps there and, and other agents to man it from the beginning to the end of the market. We had to pay their sellers. All these different excuses built in deducting, deducting, deducting from your amount so that you never, ever see the daylight. You never see a check from these distributors. Now, recently, uh, like last week, I just heard somebody online that had been taken by one of these sales reps. Couldn't even get them on the phone any, uh, any longer. And very common also. Uh, it's a cat and mouse game in Hollywood. Uh, the producers chasing down the sales rep for their money that they call sometimes call themselves quote unquote the distributor, but really they're they're a different sense of distributor. They're not actually going from taking your movie directly to be shown. They're selling it to to territories and ancillary markets. I hope that was part was clear. So uh, I spent about seven years. Uh, doing this. Uh, for a couple of years, I was actually a sales rep working for an organization of filmmakers that came together called Film Artist Network. Basically, we became our own sales agents so that we didn't have to pay all these fees and we shared fees. And that's still a good scenario today, it, or it would be if this market was still the same. But unfortunately, it's not. So what do you do? You've let's just say you've, you've just made a film. Maybe you've got a star attached. I hope you had the good sense to do that unless you're doing something like horror where it absolutely does not matter that you have a star attached or not if you've got a good horror film. Uh, one of the few, few instances where you can get away with that, that and, uh, and faith-based films. Uh, but even in faith-based films today, it's, it's if you have a one-off feature film instead of a, like, a, like a TV series, like something like uh, the, the Chosen, for instance, uh, where you're building an audience. If you have a, a one-time experience for somebody, you want to put a star in there at least to get them into, into the cinema to watch, to watch your movie. Um, so in this time, we shared, when I was working as a sales rep for, with, with Film Artist Network, our organization, uh, we, we all shared the fees. I think at one point we had 26 filmmakers uh, with our films represented at the American film market. Um, sometimes they went to like a con film festival, for instance. Uh, but my experience was at the American film market where uh, a majority of independent films uh, would get bought, uh, were bought and sold. That was a while ago, not today. Um, so you share expenses, uh, no, no hiding of the numbers, no building in expenses. Uh, everything was out in the open. Uh, you could still that, do that today with other group of filmmakers if you want to, if this same kind of scenario was a good way to go, but it's not. Today is a much, much different market. Today, you've got the ability to go directly to your audience. Um, you can, th there are ways to do that, that you can stream to your audience directly and, and, and set up paywall systems. Um, that's not something I would do per se. Uh, but you've had these, these streamers come along like Netflix and Hulu. Netflix is the big one. Netflix is, is, has been renting up every single soundstage in Los Angeles for over a decade now. And if you want to shoot there, don't expect that you're going to go shoot your, your film there because they've got all the stages locked up. Anyways, uh, you, can, you can make a pretty good deal with uh, a company like Netflix. Now, you're not going to get rich from it. Um, 
you're going to make some of your money back on, on a movie. And my expertise ranges from anywhere from, from $500,000 films up into the films that get up into the $20, $30 million range. And, and, and when you're in that budget range, in the upper range, um, you've got a lot of negotiation power because uh, you, weren't, you were not able to make a 20 or $30 million feature film without a star attached. It, you simply would not be able to raise financing for it because the risks are too high. Uh, banks know that. Investors know that. You've got to have a star attached for those, those big pictures, uh, with the, again, with the exception of horror and, and kind of faith-based films. Um, but I would recommend you go that way as well. Uh, so I'm debating whether to talk to you right now about film financing or not. Uh, maybe I'll save that for another video. But whatever you do, when you go to these streaming companies, uh, and, and I'll tell you, there's another way here in a second. Uh, yeah, always having an attorney experienced in entertainment law, not just entertainment law, specifically experienced in the law for distribution and exhibition and, and these kind of things. Uh, and, and if you go to the American film market, they'll have a standardized contract uh, that lays out all the variables for you, uh, deliverables. Uh, and, and this is something maybe you don't know, but when you're, when you're making deals for that foreign money, you're, you're going to need to supply a film that has a separate music track and a separate dialogue and effects track so that they can dub it and then add those sound effects and the music and things back in uh, without having to somehow mask the English. So that'll be part of your deal as well. Now, the other part that I was talking about here uh, was theatrical exhibition. And I don't know why this myth refuses to die that you have to go to a big player like, like 20th Century Fox or Sony or somebody uh, used to be like Lionsgate, for instance, and do a deal with them for theatrical exhibition. No, I'm going to give you the secret, your best win-win scenario here. Okay, you ready for this? You're going to do something called four-walling. Okay, four walls, one, two, three, four, inside of a cinema. What you want to do is find a market where, uh, a market could be like a city, for instance, uh, let's just say Austin, where South by Southwest happens. Uh, you want to find a market, uh, let's say you're making a horror film. You want to find a market where audiences responded well to that kind of film in the past. And you can look at box office reports and, and different things like this. Um, and let me, let me sidetrack there for a minute as well. Uh, if you get on the box office report, which is a, an official reporting of all the sales numbers that happened in all the box offices everywhere. Uh, if you get to the top of the, the cream of that at the top, you're going to get phone calls. All right. Let me go back to four walling here because this is where, uh, this is where you can get on that box office report uh, without having uh, a distributor already in line and they're going to call you. And if you're lucky, you're going to get into a bidding war between the, between the studios. So you four wall, basically what you do is you go rent a theater. Uh, and it's easier than it ever has before because movies are not getting churned out like they used to be. Theatrical motion pictures are not being produced in record numbers that they're saturating all the cinemas that your small film has no chance of getting on the big screen. Um, you know, they're lucky if they're taking uh, one of five films and showing them and spreading them across many different screens inside of a, a, a bigger theater complex. Uh, so you have a good opportunity to go into the owner and negotiate with them. Talk to them and say, okay, you know, uh, I see that you're averaging maybe 50, 75 people per audience uh, at 7 o'clock in the evening. And that's not good for you. You're not making money, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Theater Owner, Mr. Manager, okay? Let me, let me give you a better offer. I'm going to come in and guarantee you tickets that are already sold uh, for people that want to come see my movie. So instead of making 75, I'm going to double, going to double your box office gross, okay? So 
you do this in a in a in maybe a single theater or, or a couple of theaters in a, in a certain market, like I said, Austin or uh, Colorado Springs or, or wherever. Uh, usually, places where they have film festivals are good places to go. Not that you need to do it during the film festival times, um, but go go pitch that deal to them, and you know what? They're going to say yes. Because at the end of the day, they just want money coming into their box office. And they know that even your audience is going to be buying popcorn and drinks and everything else, candy, uh, because that's where they make their real number. That's where they make their real money. Uh, the, the ticket sales, that's got to go back to the, uh, the distributors. Okay? So you can do this. And you get out there and you work, work Work it, work it, work it, work it. You've got a small budget to work with, but, but because you are not uh, trying to sell it simultaneously in all the markets at the same time where you need millions of dollars of budget and you're only doing it in a small market, you can create a buzz, okay? That is the key to making your film successful if you've, got a, if you've produced a good film, okay? Get that buzz going. Spend the smaller money for wall that cinema, meaning rent that cinema for a Friday, a Saturday, your best sales times when the, when the numbers are high. Drive people through social media to get in there and see it. And there is no law against this. Some people think it's unethical. I don't see why it would be, per se. Buy your own seats up, okay? Take part of your budget and buy your seats up. Why would you do that, you say? Well, remember, if you can sell out audiences, it's going on the box office report, and this, the, the, you're going to get phone calls from the big boys. Okay? I guarantee it. Because they're looking at the box office report saying, wow, this, this movie was selling out. Uh, we, better, we better go make an offer on it right away before our other five competitors make an offer on it. Okay? And they're never going to know who... Uh, to who bought the tickets. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's just sales numbers. Okay? Um, so, I'm probably missing a few things that you've got questions about here. Uh, comment below. Ask me some of these questions. Uh, I'm not going to be able to give you uh, realistic sales numbers today. It's changed a lot. Man, if you had asked me 15 years ago or 10 years ago, I would have been able to give you breakdown sheets on what, ter what territory uh, um, paid what amount for what film. Uh, all those things would have been easy to figure out. But put your comments below. Uh, I'll try to answer them. Maybe I'll come back with another, uh, another video and answer them. Uh, and please subscribe. I will be talking about uh, film find funding here. That's going to be a different video since I didn't talk about it here today. Uh, I do want to get into talking about faith-based films because they are uh, pretty much virgin territory that will explode. You've got built-in audiences that specifically want to see these kind of films, and they don't want to see family films. They want to see entertainment where uh, you've got something like the, the Book of Eli, something that's truly entertaining. They want to see entertainment. They don't want watered down, whitewashed things. So you as a filmmaker can still make stories that entertain uh, in this market uh, and if you don't want to go in the horror direction. And as a Christian, I would push you towards doing a faith-based film anyways. Uh, so thanks for watching. Hit like, please subscribe. That helps me continue to make, uh, to build, to build these video blogs like this and to, and to spend the time doing this and sharing uh, a lifetime of information with you. Thanks.